Bibles to um, Exodus 4, and if you will, please, we would appreciate it if you make sure that your cell phones are on silent or turned on. I know we prefer to do that. We are beginning with a review of Exodus, what we've studied prior to this semester, and now we are on Lesson 12, pages 1 and 2, and our lesson today uh, is on chapter 20. Okay. So I'm so excited to be back here, being able to share the Word of God with you, and um, if you have a hard time hearing me or anything, just raise your hand and let me know, if you please. So let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, truly you are Emmanuel. You are God with us, and we love you so much. Thank you, Jesus, for revealing yourself to each one of us in experiential ways, Lord. And when we come here now, I'm asking, Lord, that as we listen, that you would open our ears, that your word would go into our hearts, Lord. Not so much what I would say, but what you want to speak to the hearts of your people today to lift us up, to edify us, to affirm us, to encourage us, and to allow us to know the power of your love and your healing. As the gospel is um, shared today, Lord, you have promised when the gospel is shared that there will be signs and wonders that follow. And we believe it. We stand firm on that and claim all the healing that you want to give us today, Lord, through signs and wonders. Whenever you want to speak to us, Lord, speak in Jesus' name. And so we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so our lesson today begins with the Ten Commandments given to Moses on Mount Sinai, as you know. And I think it's so interesting, those Ten Commandments were written on stone tablets by the finger of God. But before we move forward to our lesson, I'd like to share a bit of review with you. Um, and so, if first of all, you remember the burning bush and how God called uh, Moses. You remember the plagues, you remember the Passover and how the blood of the lamb was put on the doorposts and the lentils of each house and the angel of death would pass over them. So in Exodus 19, we're going, we've read about a theophany, in other words, a manifestation of God to man by actual um, appearances. And that's really amazing. So let's consider when God um, shows himself to you, when he appears to you, does he appear to you? And I would say today, I would say to you, yes, he appears to you. He appears to you every time you go to Mass. He appears in that Eucharistic meal. Here he is, his real presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity. He is revealing himself to you. He revealed himself to the, um, to the Israelites, and he reveals himself to us every time we receive the Eucharist. Do we even think about it? We need to, what is, to ask ourselves, what is my response? when he reveals himself to me. Are we touched in our hearts? Do we know the power of his love and are we healed? He reveals himself to us. Um, now, last time when we left off in our Exodus study, we were at the foot of Mount Sinai. Now, God had just given these following things to the Israelites. I mentioned the burning bush, I mentioned the plagues, the Passover, and but the first thing he did now um, is he rescued them. We read about that in our last lesson. He, he rescued the Israelites from that slavery, and, and he gave them freedom. Um, and we remember the Red Sea moment. They were up at the Red Sea. They didn't know where to go, and um, Pharaoh's army was breathing death threats behind them, coming at them. And all of a sudden, what did God do? He put a cloud between them and the evil coming towards them, the evil army. And then he had Moses raise his staff, and he parted the Red Sea, and they went across safely. So we will never forget that. And also that we ourselves have been in Red Sea moments at times. Sometimes everything is so, so discouraging and so terrifying, and yet we don't have any place to go. We don't know where to go, but that would be our Red Sea moment. And all we have to do is ask the Lord to set us free, and he will. I do believe that. And so um, the next thing that he did, he brought, he gave them manna from heaven. And I think if you remember manna, um, they called it manna because in the Hebrew that word meant, what is it? And I said it was another language like Spanish, so the like, KS. It would be called KS if it was Spanish instead of manna. But it was in Hebrew, so they called it manna and said, because it meant, what is that? And so here's an interesting um, bit of information on the manna. I'm so excited to read it to you. It is in the Book of Wisdom, if you want to find it. And it is chapter 
16, and this is about the manna that God gave. First of all, this scripture in Wisdom, chapter 16, beginning with verse 20, says, You gave them food of the angels. And as some of the saints have said, this is the bread of life, this is the bread of angels. You gave them the food of angels from heaven, untiringly sending them bread already prepared, containing every delight, satisfying every taste, and the substance you gave demonstrated your sweetness toward your children. For conforming to the taste of whoever ate it, it transformed itself into what each eater wished. So I guess if they had In-N-Out burgers, it could taste like an In-N-Out burger. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Word, wisdom, 16, 20, I love that. So whatever, whatever it, they wanted it to taste like, that's what it tasted like, whatever they desired. So anyway, um, here, I love that um, scripture. And then one of the second things he did, he gave them water from a rock. And do you remember Jesus' words, I am the living water. Uh, he who is the rock of salvation said to the woman at the well, and Jesus said, all you have to do is ask, and I will give you living water. Anyone who drinks the water that I shall give will never be thirsty again. The water that I shall give will turn into a spring inside of him, welling up to eternal life. And Jesus is referring to his salvation at this time. Salvation when we drink the living water of Jesus, the Holy Spirit. In this passage, it was uh, John 4, 14. And then he said in John 7, 39, that anyone who believes in him, this is what Jesus said, he will give power, and from his very belly shall flow fountains of living water. And here he was speaking of the Holy Spirit, which he would give us, and which those who believed in him would receive. And then the Israelites now encountered the Amalekites. Now remember, the Amalekites attacked them, and Moses said to Joshua, Joshua, <clears throat> I will stand on the hilltop with a staff in my hand. But when Moses came, became tired, Aaron and Hur put a rock behind him to sit on, and they held up his arms. That rock, of course, represents Jesus. And the two holding up his arms seems to me to represent the community of believers. As an example, I felt supported by all of you when Kenny was in his last days and we were journeying together. You were upholding me, just like Aaron and her upheld Moses' arms. You were blessing me. It was a huge blessing. That's prayer support for me, and I want to thank you for it, because I was in a battle for Kenny's life, and um, he was the love of my life. It was a very difficult part of my journey. So sorry. But your prayers supported me and still support me, and I thank you. So our lesson now on Exodus um, last semester came to the point where we, where the Israelites came to Mount Sinai and God reminded the Israelites of his presence with them in Exodus 19, 3 through 8. And God revealed his presence in a theophany, meaning a manifestation of God by actual appearance. And so I want to read that to you because this is what happened. This is Exodus 19, and it says this. Now at daybreak, on the third day, there were peals of thunder on the mountain, and there were lightning flashes, a dense cloud, and a loud trumpet blast. And inside the camp, all the people trembled. And then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the bottom of the mountain, the mountain of Sinai was entirely wrapped in smoke because Yahweh had descended on it in the form of fire. Like smoke from a furnace, the smoke went up, and the whole mountain shook violently. Louder and louder grew the sound of the trumpet. Moses spoke, and God answered him with peals of thunder. Yahweh came down on the mountain of Sinai on the mountain top, and Yahweh called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Others were told not, they were given a boundary not to go any farther than that. So God revealed his presence to them in that theophany. And God, as I said, still reveals his presence to us. Now the, the Israelites at the mountain on that particular day was, must have been a very powerful experience. But Moses went up the mountain as God had called them to do to worship and to praise God. And so Exodus 
19, 3 through 8 says this, God called to Moses and said, Say this to the house of Jacob. Declare this to the sons of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did with the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. From this you know that now, if you obey my voice, if you obey my voice and hold fast to my covenant, you of all nations shall be my very own. For all the earth is mine, the Lord says. I will count you a kingdom of priests, a consecrated, holy nation. Now Moses, go tell the sons of Israel what I've said. So Moses did go, and he spoke, and all the people answered, All that the Lord says, we will do. And so Moses took the reply back to God. But you know, they said it so quickly, it reminded me of my New Year's resolutions that um, I could never keep. And so I don't know that they necessarily kept this resolution either. But So I finally stopped making resolutions. New Year's resolutions. It was very wise of me, right? <laughs> but God said, if they obey, they would be a consecrated nation, and God would set them apart. So God has set you apart. God has set you apart, and this is what he says. And through grace and faith, you, you have been set apart. You are a chosen race, a holy people, a consecrated nation, a people set apart. What makes us holy is that we belong to God, we believe in Him, and so He sets us apart as a holy people. He calls you His holy people. You've been brought out of darkness into God's wonderful light, and this is by God's grace because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So raise your hand if you know you're holy. Oh, come on. You are a holy people, a consecrated nation. And do you know that you belong to Jesus? Yes. Amen. 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 And so that is what makes you holy, your belief and your faith. And so I read you the description of the theophany. And now in today's lesson, we begin the study of the law given to Moses. So that theophany, as far as our study of the Sinai experience and the law given to the Israelites through Moses, we're going to consider it today uh, as we're going to look at this because we've got to get it in pieces. It's so full and so much. So it's like a big chocolate cake that's set before you. You can't eat it all. Well, you might want to try, but you can't eat it all. And so we're, it's going to be like that, how we take these ten commands and look at them and study them. We're going to do it one piece at a time, just like eating a piece of chocolate cake one piece at a time. So over the next few weeks, this is we're going to look at the law, in other words, called the, the Old Covenant. Um, and we were looking at the, the preparation for the receiving the law. And then we're going to look at the law itself as it relates to God. And then we're going to look at the law as it relates to man. Man meaning humankind. You have to watch the gender stuff these days. You know? So this is, he's talking humankind. As it relates to humankind. And then there'll be a summarization and a response. And what is our response today? The question asked by an author, Andrew Greeley, are the Ten Commandments a strict moral code or an invitation to love? So we'll explore that a little bit as we move through the, um, through the commands. And some people have already said this, and you know this, they are not Ten Suggestions, they are Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, or which is known as the Mosaic Law, that's what the uh, people refer to the Mosaic Law, when in the New Testament when the Pharisees and Sadducees talked about the law, this is what they were talking about how to live out that law, and it ended up, they ended up having 613 laws by the time it was all finished. So this Mosaic law, meaning the law given through Moses by God, and the law, though, cannot save us. The law cannot justify us. We are justified and saved through grace by Jesus. So um, the law can, if we are obedient to the law, it can sanctify us and it helps us grow in holiness. Now the law Moses reveals our need for a savior. So the law says we know that we cannot fully live the law because we're imperfect and we are sinners. But, um, but we know that if we make every effort to follow the law, the Ten Commandments and the laws of God, that uh, we will grow in holiness. The Ten Commandments in some Bibles is referred to as the Decalogue. And it's a Greek word meaning ten words or Ten Commandments. So we're going to look uh, today at the commandments that deal with our relationship to God. And the first commandment is, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no strange gods before me. And so then God clarifies that by saying um, in Exodus 20 verses 4 through 6, he 
he establishes this in a little closer detail. Uh, first of all, you shall have no strange gods before me. And then he says, and you shall not make yourself a carved image or any likeness or anything in heaven or on earth, beneath or in the waters, under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God, and I punish the father's faults and the son's the grandsons and the great-grandsons of those who hate me, but I show kindness to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Um, so there is a punishment for putting anyone above God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. So the first commandment, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no strange gods before me, but what does that mean? No idols. We must not worship the statues we, that are in our community that we love. We love, those are reminders to us of God's love. And, and the presence of the saints, that we have a holy communion with them, but we do not worship them or bow down to them. We do not worship the statue of the Blessed Mother. We do not worship the Blessed Mother. We venerate her because she is the mother of Jesus. We do not worship the statues of Jesus. We worship Jesus. These are reminders for us of God's love. And so um, it's kind of like we hang up pictures of our loved ones and we think of them, it makes us think of them and they're smiling. We take that little snapshot and we're so glad we did it when they were little, the children are little and then they are growing and then the pictures, oh, just they are so fun. I must have close to 7,000 pictures in my phone and I love to show them to everybody. How about you guys? It's a grandma's dream cell phone so you can carry the pictures right with you. <laughs> so anyway, um, but God does not want us to worship anything above him. But these statues bring us joy. They comfort us. We have a statue of the Blessed Mother here that's so dear and sweet. And it reminds us, she's, she's pregnant in this little statue, and it reminds us she carried Jesus in her womb. That was so sweet. But even though they bring us joy when we see them, like the crucifix, where we generally wear a crucifix as Catholics because it has Jesus and it reminds us of Jesus, but we do not worship the crucifix. We don't worship that crucifix, we worship and honor Jesus who died on the cross for us. So I believe the entire community um, may have been appalled and horrified when the statue of the Pachamama was bowed down to and brought into the Vatican. That was a sad day in our history a very sad moment for our church because we do not worship the statue or the entity called Mother Earth. We do not. Jesus is our Lord and Savior, and we shall have no strange gods before us. So Jesus, we know, is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Now the law, which is referred to um, as the law given to Moses at Mount Sinai, was referred to by Jesus, who said, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. And he was the only one that could fulfill the law because he was sinless. He was the only one who could live the law perfectly. The Mosaic Covenant was conditional on the basis of our obedience, if you obey. And we need to obey those commands. But the covenant with Abraham, he is our father. And that covenant is unconditional and was in no way altered by the Mosaic Covenant. The purpose of God as revealed in the covenant of Abraham still stands. Now many people um, began to worship the Blessed Mother. In 1950, um, there was a dogma, the fourth dogma of the Blessed Mother was uh, stated and made visible to us as a Catholic community, as a community of believers. And that dogma was presented to us, uh, and it was the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary into heaven, meaning that she was carried up into heaven bodily. And so, but there are now people who want to sign petitions and send, like, you know, they're voting up on the recall, they're sending a petition or whatever, voting, that they want the Blessed Mother to be called co-redemptor. And that co-redemptrix is not what God wants. Uh, John Paul II did a commission on that, and there are many pages to that commission, and he investigated why it could not be, uh, because no one is equal with, with God. And there are people who teach, even on relevant radio, that, that, co that they're battling to have her known as a co-redeemer. She, she did not redeem us. 
She did not go to the cross for us. She stood at the foot of the cross because of her love for her son. But Jesus is the one who bled on the cross. He was the one who had the passion. He's the one that died for us, if that makes sense. So uh, we will have no strange gods before us, and we will not. Um, that dogma, I don't know. I'm sad about it because um, no one is equal. No one is equal to God. Amen. So in the first commandment, God is commanding us to put him above everything, to love him first with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our minds, with all our strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. He says, if we do have idols, God says in Exodus 20, verse 5, and Matthew 4, 10, he says, if we do have idols, it means we hate him. So let's not have any idols. To believe and trust he is the God who, br who brings us out of bondage, Jesus is God, and he brings us out of the bondage of our slavery to sin. If we do not believe that God's above everything and everyone, then we do not have faith. Our faith is that we believe God exists and that he sent his only son Jesus for our salvation. I memorized that scripture last week. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. And so Jesus is our salvation. And the Holy Spirit exists in us. Kenny and I used to tease each other, but it was sincere in our hearts. We were each other's number two because Jesus was our number one. And so it was just such a blessing. And when I shared that many years ago, um, one of the ladies um, went home and said, Oh, honey, you're my number two. And he was very upset because he did not know Jesus as Lord. And so it was an unhappy time for him and for her because he... He was unhappy what she said. But what would be some of the sins against the first commandment? I made a little bit of a list here. First of all, a denial of God. Secondly, unbelief about the truths of faith. Number three, failure to profess our faith when we are called to do so. Uh, but one of the good things I love about our Catholic Mass is that when we go in, uh, we on Sundays we always confess the creed. We confess who he is and who we are in relationship to God. And the fourth one is the worship of some created thing instead of the true God. So this list um, also, the sin against it is superstition. That includes astrology, belief in good luck, dreams, fortune tellers, mm -hmm. yoga practices, Reiki practices, voodoo practices, witchcraft practices, and um, I hate to say it these days, but they brought something new in called mindfulness. So, yeah, it's, it's a new, new age practice. A new, new age practice. <laughs> so, what I wanted to share with you, um, this, this scripture, it's in, um, let's see if I can find it here. It's in 1 Samuel. Now, we are told not to worship anything or to do any divination or anything like that. In other words, divination is seeking an answer or what's going to happen to us. That's why astrology is so bad. Um, and seeking a psychic or anything like that. But um, this, this scripture, it's, it's chapter 28 in 1 Samuel. This, so people think that it doesn't exist. It exists. Mm -hmm. This is Saul and the witch of Endor. And Samuel, Samuel the prophet was dead, and all Israel had mourned him and buried him at Ramah, his own town. Saul had expelled the necromancers and wizards from the country. The necromancers are the, are the witchcraft. So meanwhile, Saul, disguising himself, changing his clothes, set out and accompanied by two men, went to visit a woman at night. And he wanted the future disclosed to him by means of a ghost. So people say, oh, I don't believe in ghosts. Well, here it is in the Bible. There is such a thing. It's, you know, a, a soul or something that is, is not resting with Jesus in heaven. So conjure up, this is what Saul asked the witch of Ender to do. And this is verse 8, conjure up the one I shall name to you. The woman answered, look, you know what Saul has done and how he has swept the necromancers and wizards out of the country. Why are you setting a trap for my life then to have me killed? But Saul swore to her by Yahweh, as Yahweh lives, no blame shall attach to you for this business. And the woman said, who shall I conjure up for you? 
conjure up Samuel. So they actually, the witch of Endor actually conjured up this ghost of Samuel. And so, and so there are some people who do that kind of thing. Then the woman saw Samuel and giving a great cry, she said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman answered Saul, I see a ghost rising up from the earth. What is it like? He asked. She answered, it's an old man coming up. Uh, his face is wrapped in a cloak. And then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down his face to the ground in homage. And then Samuel said, why have you disturbed my rest, conjuring me up? Saul replied, I'm in great distress. The Philistines are waging war against me, and God has abandoned me, and no longer answers me either by prophet or dream. So I have summoned you to tell me what I must do. So isn't that a sad thing, a sad situation? Um, we, we do know these things exist. We do know that they happen. And it is called divination. In Leviticus 19.31, it says, Do not turn to uh, mediums, or it will make you unclean. Deuteronomy 18.9-12, Anyone who practices uh, divination or inquires of the dead is an abomination to the Lord. In Acts 16.16, 16, there's a slave girl who had a spirit um, that she was uh, antagonizing Paul. And I thought that was really interesting, um, um, that that particular spirit um, in Acts. Now, what she was doing seemed okay, but what she was actually doing was Paul was giving the gospel message, and she was yelling. She started following Paul and shouting out, and here are the servants of the Most High God. They have come to tell you how to be saved. So every day she said this. And so I have this little bit of an experience I'll share with you early on in, um, in Women's Christian Fellowship. There were only like 12 of us we met in that little room, the patio annex. And um, I, one day, I'll give you one example. This, this went on for a while until I rebuked her, uh, like Paul rebuked that, that slave girl. Um, I, would, I was talking one day about Jesus is saying, I was using John 3, 3 through 5, Jesus said, you must be born again through water and the Spirit. And I went through the whole scripture and everything. And at, when I finished, we were going to take a break. I finished, and um, we, were, that, we were only 12 of us, so when we had coffee, then we were taking a coffee break. And so anyway, she, in this shrill voice, said, you must be born again. You must be born again. And so I was like, whoa. And so finally, I just said, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that spirit. That's a disruptive spirit. Anyway, she left and she never came back. Now, I didn't feel good about that, but I did pray for her, and I, I felt sad that she had done that. But it kept on. But St. Paul, when I read chapter 16, that verse 16, about how Paul took care of the slave girl that kept saying, she wasn't saying anything wrong, so to speak. She was saying, listen to him. But it was disruptive spirit. And so anyway, we pray against that. Before you get here, if I haven't prayed um, the deliverance prayer before you get here on Thursday mornings, then I'll pray it when you are here. So we always pray a deliverance prayer. And I think I shared with you before this little story, but um, I could not figure out why my third grade class was so anxious, so anxious, and, and couldn't sit still. Uh, they came after school, the, the kids, for their uh, CCD classes. And so anyway, I thought, and so normally I never went to Mass that morning because I was always preparing my lesson. That morning I went to Mass and I realized it was on a, whatever day it was, the night before they had bingo here. Mm -hmm. And there was a spirit that was defiling this place, that transferred to this place, and the kids were, it was a spirit of anxiety. And so I determined when I saw the Mass, I came into Mass, we used to have Mass in this area and the altar was here, and the, um, when I came to Mass that morning, I saw drunk popcorn and trash on them, and I thought, oh my gosh, what is this? Oh, I said, oh, they had bingo the night before. <laughs> and so it dawned on me, if it is physically messy, it had to be spiritually messy. And so I came, I thought, I'm going to come early, so I came early to teach the class that day, and I stood in the middle of the room, and um, I prayed the deliverance prayer, and I commanded any spirit of disruption, any spirit of agitation or anxiety. You know, when people play bingo, come on, it's B4, B4, say B4. And you know how they do that. I think I've done that. And so anyway, um, so I said that deliverance prayer. And when I did, this is kind of my first experience to know uh, and how to 
God teaches me how to pray. So I prayed that deliverance prayer, and I heard the windows began to shake, and and it was like, oh my gosh, everything was moving, and I knew that spirit was gone. From that point on, I began to always pray, leave to any evil spirit, leave without noise touching or harming anyone. So anyway, that's where that came from, and so I knew I needed to do that. But I want to share with you back to this uh, ghost thing. And just do people do that in this day and time? There was a movie, we all love the movie, um, about somebody uh, possessing their, the wife or something like or the husband, something like that. And um, Whoopi Goldberg was in that movie. But anyway, I had an uncle who wanted to consult spirits to help him and he, to help he and his family. But his family was not in a good place. Even his home, the, even his home, everything started crumbling in his home. I thought, what is going on here? And then I realized what was he was doing and what was going on. And he would, this is what would happen. He would call on this entity to give him advice. And this entity, sometimes they couldn't, he couldn't come back to himself, to his normal. So they would call the children, and his wife would call my grandma, my grandma. Could you yes. close to the Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Okay. So. Thank you. Now, I, they would call my grandma Cleo, who was a prayer warrior, and she would come and she would pray deliverance and to get rid of that spirit that was attached to my uncle. And so, um, anyway, it was a it was a challenge. And when I discovered that, I knew that was happening. But when he came to visit me, he was still in a in a bad place. But by the grace of God, through prayer, my mom and I prayed for him. Uh, we prayed deliverance, and he was delivered and set free. And when we prayed for him, and he invited Jesus to come into his heart and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he was set free, and he was a changed man, and his family was changed. It was very powerful. But people do that today. They, they still do it. They try to conjure up a ghost and channel. We had one lady come one time, and I'm not saying it scared me, but I do think it was weird, and that is... She, she loved this bird that she had so much, and she, was trying to, she would try to talk to the bird. She put the bird, after the bird died, she put it in the freezer. Now, so she could consult the bird. Now, is that weird or what? We can't do that. No, I'm the Lord thy God that shall be no strange gods before me. Don't consult anything, anybody, any spirit, anything like that. Make sense? It does. So, anyway, um, I told you about the slave girl and how this one lady would just shout. Um, saying what I just said. I was saying, I just said that. But anyway, the first commandment, I am Lord your God, you shall have no strange gods before me, and you must not make yourself a carved image or bow down to them, for there is a punishment when we do. And that's why it was so scary with the Pachamama, because um, none of us wanted to be part of that in our Catholic community, and they actually carried the Pachamama into the Vatican, St. Peter's, for Mass. And um, it was a sad day, so we might pray that God would purify us from that. So the second commandment seems pretty clear. You must not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, we're commanded to reverence and revere the name of God. Our Father, when speaking about God and holy things, he is our Father, and Jesus is our Lord. So we don't want to say anything that would harm or um, blaspheme the name of God. So I was a little girl, and I think I was in the um, grade class of my catechism, is what we called it, my catechism class. And Mrs. Franey, who was a sweet little lady, gave the class, and she was telling us we were talking about the the Ten Commandments, and she was saying, we must never take the name of the Lord that God made. If you ever hear anybody do that, now I want you to say, blessed be God, blessed be his holy name. And so I went home, and my daddy, my mom never used foul language. My daddy, um, he he was never angry. He was just part of this conversation, and part of his language, you know? And uh, I guess he didn't have any other words. But um, at dinner that night, because we always sat at a table, dinner, around, praying, and all that, and so now my daddy took God's name in vain, and I said, Bless be God, bless be his holy name. And nothing was said. 
And then he did it again. And I said, Blessed be God, blessed be his holy name. And pretty soon he did it again. And I said, Blessed be God, blessed be his holy name. He said, Angie, what is going on here? I said, Well, Daddy, I told him about Mrs. Franey and what she had said. And we're so, if we're supposed to hear, we hear somebody take God's name in vain, we're supposed to say, Blessed be God, blessed be his holy name. Even in these last few years when I've been at the movie and I've heard people say that out loud, I say, Blessed be God, blessed be his holy name. Because a lot of people do use foul language when they talk and use the name of God uh, in vain. But anyway, my daddy said, did I do that? And I said, yes, daddy, you did. He said, well, every time I do it, you say that, and I'll try to not to do it anymore. Isn't that sweet? Yes. But anyway, um, we are not to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. We're not to speak disrespectfully about our holy God. We must not make false oaths or break holy vows. We had a friend um, who has since gone to the Lord. She was a dear friend of mine, but she had nine brothers. And every time, she was the only girl, and every time on a weekend, if she would go visit her brothers, she would come home using foul language, and we said, well, what happened to her, you know? I didn't understand transference of spirits or defilement of spirits um, at that time, but we would say to her, now, why did you, why did you say that? And she's, she would just get into the habit. She would go back into that place where her family was and she would hear her brothers talking and she would come back and use that same language. So we, we talked to her about it and she, she repented and, and convinced herself and us that she would not do that anymore, but she would use God's word to edify, affirm, and build up the body of Christ. Um, when we're studying the sacred scriptures in Ephesians 5, 3 and 4, even if you're angry, guard against foul talk. Let your words be for the improvement of others, as Scripture says. And I believe my husband, Kenny, had a gift to affirm, edify, encourage, and build up the body of Christ. It was something we always prayed that would, he would be able to do uh, and I would be able to do at our Bible studies. That was our heart's desire. So we need to be obedient to St. Paul, who, when he says, let, you, let your speech always be gracious seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer each person and we answer each person in love god bless you and when i was that little girl in my catechism class i just loved that and i've kept it all through these years and and even when my friend um would say something i would say blessed be god bless be his holy name um and the scripture says there must be no coarseness or salacious talk in you and no coarse jokes, it says. So there's one more command that deals with God's relationship to man, meaning humankind, as I said, and that is to keep holy the Sabbath day. Um, in Genesis 2, 2, it says, On the seventh day, God completed the work of creation, and God blessed the seventh day, and rested on the seventh day, and made it holy. And so Jesus said in Mark 2, um, 27, 28, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus said this because he had delivered a man from an unclean spirit and healed many people and it was a Sabbath. And the Pharisees were angry with him because he did that. They didn't even, they couldn't even see the power of God's miracle in Jesus because they were so judging him because it was a Sabbath day. So when I was growing up on Sunday in our little town, um, the holy day was always observed on Sundays, and it was left unto the Lord. So our family always went to Mass, and then we, we had an early meal in the midday, and um, it, was, it was just a different day. It was set aside to be holy, and my mom did not allow us to, not even sew, but Mother, I like to sew, it's fun. No, and no crocheting on Sunday. Just didn't do it, because her, it was work, and so we had to be obedient. It was a holy day to remember the goodness of God, and it was a time set apart to honor God. Now, God gave the law through these Ten Commandments to define sin and bring order to our lives. Galatians 3.19 reveals how long the Mosaic Law would be in force. And this is the, this is the um, quote, until the seed came to whom the promise was addressed. So the seed promised is the Messiah, which was fulfilled in Jesus. Now I wanted to look up, you know how you Google everything, me, I Google everything, I have a question. How many, how many prophecies were fulfilled when Jesus was born and, and did his, um, his, through his life, death, and resurrection? 
people actually gave numbers. Somebody counted it up, but there were so many different numbers, I decided, well, who knows? And I'm not going to go through the Bible to find them at this point. So we remember that we are not saved through the Ten Commandments, but by grace, through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works. So I pray through the study of these Ten Commandments, we will grow in holiness through our obedience to them. Galatians 3.24 says, The law was to be our guardian until Christ came, and we will be justified by faith. For by grace are you saved, and not that of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the law, uh, St. Paul called the law, work. So anyway, I thank you, Lord, for this, um, this lesson. Lord. Allow your seeds to take root in our hearts for your eternal glory. Uh, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.